Um, but yeah, so this is this is my setup. Exclamation mark setup for alternative pictures and um, detailed uh, run through of the gear and stuff. But we have the Neutron. So this is uh, a semi-modular analog synthesizer. Really good. You can see all of the patch bay there that I've got set up. Um, I've had that since the start of the project. So really nice. I use that in my ambient for uh, the drone that you can hear in in the sort of lows, low frequencies. And I have a nice elephant on it, which gives it some movement. Then we've got the Behringer 305, which is a mixer. So that's new with the rack that I built a few weeks back. So this was designed to take the inputs, or the outputs, sorry, from the Neutron, the K2 and the Juno, and then put it into a nice mixer that I can tweak. Uh, we've got the Dope for Wasp filter. That's currently filtering the, uh, the Juno power supply and then the Behringer K2, which provides some sort of like mids, nice sort of uh, portmanteau notes going up and down. And then we have the two launch pads. So these two launch pads, um, obviously you've got the, the session mode, which shows the clips in Ableton, but then you've got three user templates. So on this one, I have uh, the drums template. So this template for my normal improv controls three different drum tracks and then my EXO drum sequencer so I have a total of four drum track sequences that I can sort of mix between so these buttons will toggle mute the kick snare hi-hat hi-hat open clap uh, ride symbol um, shaker and tom those are some predefined sort of noise sweeps that I have in that project. For the ambient project, this doesn't do anything because I don't have drums in my ambient project. And then we've got the keys tab. So this controls um, the patch selection for my guitar. So I use Guitar Rig 6 uh, as a virtual pedal board instead of actual pedals because I don't have actual pedals. Um, so these buttons control which preset gets selected. For the ambient stuff, I only have two rows, but for my normal improv, I have three rows. Uh, this button here, toggles between the Q for me so you can't hear it because the Q only goes to my headphones but that allows me to basically hear what's going on pre effects and that's really interesting for the ambient because with the ambient most of it is like reverb and effects so listening to the dry signal is yeah it's very interesting and then we've got a button here which uh, creates a marker in Reaper for editing I don't use that in the ambient because I don't edit the ambient I upload it straight to YouTube and then finally on this launch pad, the user template. Um, I honestly can't really remember what all of these functions do, but it's usually something to do with MIDI. So I think that's to toggle between eighth notes and 16 notes of, a, uh, of an arpeggiator. That enables the arpeggiator that holds the note. Um, what does that do? I can't remember what that does. I think that one adds an octave and that one adds a, a negative octave to the MIDI notes. That selects uh, my gate sequencer and then this, I think, toggles mute for the MIDI, which is actually uh, important because when you mute an audio track, obviously mutes the effects as well. So what I do instead is I mute the incoming note signals for each of the tracks so that the FX can sort of trail off and fade out rather than just hard stop which sounds a bit weird and on the second launch pad we can session mode and then we've got the drums template I don't really use this um, but it's there so these will trigger different drum clips uh, for each track so all my drums are, are color coded so kick snare hat open hat clap ride shaker tom so the kick is always red, the snare is always yellow, the blue is always hat, etc, etc, and that matches to this as well. Um, these buttons stop the clip, that selects the track, and then that arm records the track. We've got the, uh, the, the second keys template, so those two control um, something in Ableton, like quantize and loop length. I can't remember what any of these do. I don't. I probably don't use them. Can't remember what any of them do. And then the user template. Um, so this one, this row. What does this row do? Ah, 
Ah, yeah, so this row um, allows me to um, output the audio from each track as a sort of secondary source. So I can double it up. These just select the, the, the tracks in Ableton. This allows me to toggle on and off the, uh, the queue for each track. So when I'm queuing, I can turn off certain tracks if they're too loud or whatever, and I can listen to one or more track to sort of build up my next melodies. And then this toggles the output to stream. So for my ambient, those do the same. Um, most of these other buttons don't do anything. That one selects the audio loop, that one arm records the track, and no, sorry, this one resets the track. I don't use that for the ambient because I don't ever reset any of the tracks. I'll show you why I do that in my, uh, in my radio project after. And then this one arm records the track. And that's it for the launch pads. There's a lot of macros going on. It's really difficult to keep track on what they actually do. Um, and if, especially if I haven't done a radio improv in a while, I forget what they do. I used to have little stickers along the side that sort of reminded me, but it looked a bit shit when it was down here, so I just took them off. And then we got my favourite piece of equipment, the Oxy One Sequencer. So this is my master clock. This controls the BPM of the project. Ableton is synced to this, so this drives it. For the ambient, this controls everything. So this controls uh, the drone, so that's the neutron. It's just doing one note at the moment. The second uh, sequencer controls the K2. You can see it's got a few notes that are selected. Um, they're all sort of like randomly percentage chance to trigger, so it's not it doesn't sound too melodic, it's a bit more sort of like... Um, number three is Stochastic's uh, sequencer, so this is more of like a randomly generated sequencer. Each note is a probability, um, and that controls the Juno. And then number four is Matricial, which is a very cool sequencer. So it's Matricial has four sub-sequencers in this one sequencer, and each one of these controls um, the yellow, blue, pink and green track of the project. Um, and each page that you can see here allows you to set a parameter for each step that gets triggered. So here we've got these triggers, so every time the step hits a trigger, it triggers a note, and then it calculates what the note is based on all the parameters on all of the other pages. So it's really cool to generate some weird and random sequences, and I've got that going. Uh, yeah. And then we've got the push to, so this controls Ableton, can't really see the screen, but it's set up so each of the buttons corresponds to a track, so I usually stick to about eight tracks for making music, because I don't really like having to scroll through pages and pages of tracks. Um, we've got the Juno, so that's just a, a boutique synth, replica of the Juno synth, pretty straightforward. We've got the Fader Fox PC4, so the Fader Fox, um, each colour pair controls the low pass and high pass filter for each track that I have. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six audio tracks, uh, sorry, six MIDI tracks. We've got um, filter for the guitar track and then volume for the guitar tracks and then uh, two filters for the two drum tracks and then these ones are just sort of volume, input volume for the guitar and then drum volume. And then we've got the Akai MIDI mix. So the Akai MIDI mix is it's not used in the ambient because again don't have drums but this is mapped for the drums so we have high pass low pass and then pan for each of the drum tracks so kick snare hat again color coded and then the volume for each of the uh, drum tracks as well you can't see it under the desk but i have a complete control keyboard um this is pretty much the brain of my radio improv i don't really use it too much for the ambient because the oxy one controls the ambient but i still use all of the instruments through complete control because i have a massive library of different patches so i've got a good selection for different sounds although i don't really change the sounds too much for the ambient um, maybe every like couple of weeks or so and that's that's my gear um i pretty much use it the same way for each of the projects but yeah that's that's my gear let me swap over to um, my Ableton scene. Hopefully I've still got the audio. Cool, yeah. Uh, I need to move Ableton though because it's on the wrong screen.
Right, so you can see that and you can still hear, yeah? Cool. Okay, maybe I need... My, mou my mouse is here, but my screen is here, so it's a bit... It's a bit awkward, but... spare USB ports otherwise I'd get my I'd get my um, wireless keyboard and mouse anyway anyway so this is my Ableton project for my ambient so this is based on my radio improv project um, it looks complicated but it's actually not as complicated as my radio project but let's go through it anyway. So, starting with my utilities. Let me let me fucking sit down. Maybe I'll. That's better. That's better. Much better. Okay. So, starting with the utils group. So you can see that. Yep. Good. So. This is the same between two projects. So this is basically all of my MIDI utilities. Um, we have a track that allows me to output MIDI from Ableton and then capture it in Reaper. So K, um, Kai, I think you said something about you asked. Oh no, Solid BPM. You asked about Reaper and Ableton. So um, the audio from Ableton gets routed to Reaper via uh, Reastream. Um, and the reason why I do that is because my radio project, I record all of the stems for each of the tracks, or all the output for each of the tracks, I record the stems. I edit them in Reaper, and then I export it um, as a single WAV file. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this track allows me to send MIDI CC to Reaper, and I mostly do that so that I can um, create markers, uh, so when I'm editing it's a bit easier. Then we've got, uh, don't use that track, we've got the push route. So the push is really weird because um, it doesn't output on one channel, it outputs on multiple channels. And that's a problem when you're expecting one channel or if you have routing set up like I do, but you've got a different channel for each instrument that you use. So the push is really weird. So what this track does is it takes the input from all channels on the push you can't see the drop down but the push input for all channels and then it basically just loop loop backs um and forces them all onto onto channel one um so that i can use it for all of my midi tracks without it fucking up other stuff you can see the cake is teasing you just just sat there waiting to be eaten um and then we've got some oxy routings. So in my project, I have a different MIDI channel for each instrument, for each track. So uh, the red track is channel 12, the yellow track is channel, channel 13, the blue track is channel 14, pink track is channel 15, and then the green track is channel 16. So they're, they're also uh, number, number coded. So you can see here, you can't see that anymore, but the red track is labelled track 2, so channel 12, 10 plus 2 is uh, the channel for that track. And then I basically just route that to the actual track within Ableton. Uh, and then I've got a couple of MIDI tracks here that allow me to... I don't actually use this in this project, in the Ambient project, but it's useful nonetheless. I can basically um, combine one MIDI channel um, to play both the Neutron, you can't see it again, both the Neutron and the K2, which is useful. Uh, and then, yeah, that's just more MIDI routings for the Neutron, the K2, and the Juno. Then we've got um, my uh, virtual pedal board. So this is where the audio comes in from for my guitar. So this comes in from Reaper, which is running uh, Guitar Rig got uh, a gain knob and then some utilities that are just turned off at the moment and then my cue track so this is where all of my audio tracks run to runs to cue and then that 
send to my Q input on Reaper, and then I can toggle solo on that within Reaper to hear the to hear the Q. So that's the MIDI utilities. This is the horn track. So if you do channel point redemption for a horn, it triggers a note which then plays in this track. There's a little random, so it will select a random sample, and then it will just play that sample. We have the announcer uh, audio track here, audio three, a couple of clips for just like randomly playing different samples that I have loaded. Um, but you can see here I have a whole bunch of different samples, so like station announce, um, generic train, a French sample, etc. I do have a couple of like non train based samples, like some water droplets, um, the breakbeat, and then like a sort of TikTok style tick, 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 tick which is quite cool. Uh, this allows, uh, this sends audio to the queue, so when I toggle queue, all of the audio pre-filter and effects get sent to, to Reaper so I can hear what the sound sounds like before going through all of the effects. And then on every single track that I've got I have a, a filter which has an LFO applied so it's got some movement, uh, an EQ just to cut out the lows and then you know trim down some of the mids, an auto pan to make it have some, some movement again. The, the ambient project's all about movement and sort of being semi-generative so it doesn't sound stale I can just let it go and it does its thing uh, we have a compressor so every track has a compressor with various different settings and a generic volume knob and then a track filter which is mapped to the fader fox we have these two audio tracks here that are audio tracks on my guitar um, they're basically exactly the same so again we have the, the Q output we have the filter EQ auto pan compressor volume filter and that's the same on the second audio track for my guitar and then we have our four MIDI channels so these are um, they're all the same these four MIDI channels again but just a different instrument loaded excuse me we have an arpeggiator um, on the red channel because with uh, with my ambient I quite like having sort of delay arpeggiator going off in the background rather than just a single drone it gives it a bit more, more character and that's what I use the red track for um, but you don't want too much so I add a little bit of a, like a random chance so it doesn't let every note through and then again an audio uh, auto filter with an LFO a compressor an EQ um, a volume utility and a, a track filter and that's the same for each of these different tracks they just have a different sound loaded um, yeah and then we have the EXT channel which is the input from all of my hardware synths so there's only one input for the hardware synth which makes it difficult to edit because it's three audio signals merged into one um, unlike all the other channels where they're all individual tracks and they all get recorded individually uh, but we have in Ableton we have our external instrument so we can send MIDI information to our synths and then we have on this channel because it's a merged audio signal I want to send the, the subs so the low frequencies on to, off to a second separate track so that it doesn't get muddied by all of the reverbs so this modified patch that I have here will send everything below 300 Hertz which should mostly be the K2 um, over to a separate uh, return track which I'll show you in a sec tuner because I have to always tune my neutron because it's always out and you can see it's out right now um, we cut down the lows or cut out the lows after we've sent them because we don't want to then send them to the reverbs. Um, a little bit of a high, uh, sorry, low pass auto filter with a little bit of LFO. Um, again, a little bit of EQ and then volume ut utility and track filter. So the, that's the audio and MIDI tracks. The, the key to ambient, and if you're looking to get to ambient, this is, this is the trick. So I have here four 
return tracks with various different um, reverbs attached and they're all EQ'd and uh, filtered for a specific frequency band so on the first one I have ROM which is my favorite you can't see it because it's a floating window but this is my favorite reverb I use this in pretty much everything really nice sort of solid choice reverb um, this one only takes uh, between 200 hertz and 5000 hertz uh, audio runs it through the reverb adds a little bit of really s just a small amount of uh, movement on the auto pan um, cut out a little bit of highs and then just EQ it a little bit and then same on the second sense track but this one runs black hole which is another really good uh, reverb I got this on offer last year really nice for uh, particularly for guitar um, I have a little bit of an LFO on the ribbon so with black hole you have a ribbon parameter which allows you to sort of modulate the values of the reverb so that kind of does a little bit of modulation on that for me and this takes between 300 and 7000 Hertz audio and again a little bit of EQ, a little bit of filter, a little bit of movement. The third one I have is the Valhalla Supermassive. Again, another very nice reverb, and this one's free, so definitely worth picking up. And this takes a 200 between 15,000 hertz audio, and a, again, EQ, auto pan, filter. You might see you might see a little bit of a pattern emerging with how I structure my my projects. And then finally, on my flex reverb sends um, I currently have Gigaverb which is quite nice uh, this is a Max for Live reverb plugin that's uh, someone recommended to me a few weeks back um, but this is my sort of flexible track I can swap in and out different reverbs to try different sounds and different things and this takes between 100 and uh, 10,000 Hertz audio and again filter EQ so that's my reverbs. I then have a, um, a a delay. So this runs Replica XT. This is my go-to um, my go-to delay. I'm not a huge fan of the Ableton delays and echo. I don't know why. I just can't ever really get it sounding as nice as I can with Replica. Uh, and this takes everything over 300 hertz because you don't want to you don't want to delay lows it just it sounds bad and then I do a hard cut for the lows sorry a hard EQ for the lows and then I also you can't see the floating window but I also do a little bit of a cut for the lows within the delay itself we have our dry signal so the dry signal um, is a combination of uh, no sorry the dry signal is just another send so on each track you can see A, B, C, D, those are the reverbs, E is the delay, and then F is the uh, the dry signal. So I don't really send a lot of the dry signal through from each of the track. The horn I send dry signal, um, my synths I send a dry signal, but everything else is sort of just a little bit of the dry signal because the magic comes from the reverb. Um, yeah, that's the thing, it's really easy to get phasing with um, with ambient so doing some EQ or heavy EQs heavy compression and um, filtering really helps um, it doesn't ultimately matter at the end of the day because ambient is very sort of sounds quite fluid so even if you do get phasing it can sound good it just can give you unexpected results so like for example you might be adding guitar and not actually be able to hear it because it's just getting phased out so hard um, and that happens quite a lot so yeah EQ definitely helps uh, yeah that's the dry signal so I've got a little bit of um, glue compression just to stop any peaks from peaking uh, that oh, that filter isn't actually doing anything so and then I cut down the lows and the reason why I cut down the lows is because I have a separate sub return so this takes all of the subs from my external track mainly the neutron to let through the lows without it sounding muddy a um, little bit of compression uh, high cut to cut out all of the highs not that it gets any anyway but just you know to be sure and then just a little bit of reverb just a, just a smidge of reverb I don't want to send it through my normal reverbs because they're a bit they're, they're tuned for like very long tails whereas this is just to 
sort of blend it in a little bit better. And then I have a send track for all of the reverbs. So all of these reverbs output to this track, which then has a compressor, a limiter, and a filter. And then all of that goes into my master track, where I have another compressor, another compressor, a limiter to boost volume, um, a filter to cut down just a little bit the very highs, although I probably don't need that anymore. And then an EQ8 just to, again, help with the phasing a bit. And then a volume. And then a spectral analyzer. You can see the lovely frequency um, distribution. I have a lot of subs. So if you've got some good headphones, it sounds so much better. Like it just sounds very sort of full and warm. And then finally, I've got Rio Stream, which then outputs to OBS. And that's the ambient project. That's pretty much it. Um, I don't think I've missed anything. Again, it's it's very technical, but this project is based on my radio project template, which I've been building for the last two years. So a lot of this is sort of legacy. You know, you sort of build as you go, you find new ways of doing things, so you implement it and stuff like that. Um, and that's the Ambient project. So let me um, let me stop this now, because that's the Ambient done. We'll save this, and then I'll open up my radio my radio set. This is going to take a while to to load up because it's massive. It's an absolutely fucking massive project. So yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll cut that out. I'll cut that out and upload that to my um to my YouTube. But I'm sure it will change by the time I upload it. That's the thing with my my streams is that I'm always sort of working on these projects and changing things. What do I use for the ambient in uh, for the reverb in the ambient app? So I use um ROM, I use um Valhalla Supermassive, Black Hole, and then Gigaverb. I, d I think I list them in if you type exclamation mark setup. I think I do actually list them in that, except for the flex. At the time I was using RC20, but it's a flexible track, so it's always sort of chopping and changing. Right. Again, it takes absolutely forever for this project to open up. If it opens up, I really hope it opens up, because there's a high chance that it will just ableton will just crash it crashed for me this morning right before i went live i was like oh come on but whilst we're waiting for that to load up let me go to my other scene so we can look at the gear instead because that's always fun yeah so a little bit about um about my vfx so the videos that i'm using in the background um are from the nrk norwegian arctic circle line so I think in 2013, they recorded this as part of something. I don't really know what, um, but they released all of the footage online. Someone made an archive of it before they got deleted, and that's where you can download them. But it's basically this particular uh, line is four journeys of the same route and the same line um, f for each different season. So summer, winter, autumn, and spring. So there's about 40-odd hours of content. Um, and what I've done is I have gone through those 40 hours and I've cut clips out um, between tunnels. So when a train leaves a tunnel and goes into a tunnel, I cut that out as a clip. Um, and then I run that in OBS using the VLC plugin to randomly select a clip. So as um, as the train goes into a tunnel, it will select a new clip and it will come out of the tunnel and it will look seamless. But now that, now that the magic is spoiled, but, you know, that's fine. Okay, cool, it's loaded. All right, back to the Ableton scene. All right, so this, this, this is the beast. All right, so this is my radio project. So starting again from uh, the right side, we have... The Q track works exactly the same as the uh, the ambient project. So this sends audio from all of my audio tracks into this track, 
which then outputs to a specific audio um, channel, which I can then toggle on and off in my ear to hear what's coming out before it comes to stream or if it's not being sent to stream. We have a click track. So I found um, a while back that it's really difficult to edit um, music, especially music that is being quantized and uh, sort of synced with external hardware because it drifts. And when audio drifts, particularly along um, over a large amount of time, um, when you're cutting out large chunks of audio, it's very tedious to have to then realign the, the audio. So what this click track does, it's literally just a note on each of the, uh, a note on each step, I guess. Whoops. Um, and that sounds a very loud click to Reaper. And then within Reaper, I can convert that to transient markers, which then allows me to sort of cut between instead of using a grid. Uh, which is a lot, lot, lot better, and it's sped up my editing time by, by five times. We have our utilities. So utilities, again, it's exactly the same as my radio, uh, my ambient project, um, but from right to left we have um, Reaper CC. So each of my tracks, um, one to eight, um, I can toggle on and off the queue. And when I toggle on and off the queue, it sends a marker CC, sends a CC to Reaper, which then triggers a marker, which I then go back and I use to edit. So when something's in queue, I know that needs to get cut out because it, there's nothing that happens. It's just me fucking about with sounds and um, stuff like that. So not useful for the actual end end audio so that just gets cut out very useful um right we have so this is my push track so um this is the same principle as in my uh my ambient project but i have one track for each of my midi tracks where it takes the input from the push and it just outputs to that track um so that i can use the push without it freaking out it's the only way i could get it actually working with like my setup i'm sure if you use just the push by itself then it's fine but because i've got the keyboard and i've got the oxy one as midi sources that it just messes up with all of the different channels and yeah it's weird so this fixes that by forcing it all into a single track uh this these groups here so that's again same principle but for uh, the oxy one so each channel 16 15 14 13 12 11 10 and 9 get rooted to each of my midi tracks so those are the three hardware synths 9 10 11 and then these are the the five soft synths uh, where is this one this is my this is my drum track. So in my Oxy One, I have two different projects. I have my radio project and I have my ambient project. So this is what my radio project looks like. It's a bit bare because I cleared it all for, for today. Um, but I have, you can't see it because I'm on the wrong scene. There. Right, so we have, um, the oxy one for my radio project the first track is usually set for my neutron although i don't really use it second track is usually set for my k2 although i don't really use it the third track is set for my second drum track and then the fourth sequencer track is set for my primary drum track um, and then going from bottom to top the different um, pads for my drum kit so kick snare hat open hat clap ride shaker tom and you can see here I've got a basic 4-4 pattern, I think. Nope, uh, just a basic kick pattern. Two on the um, on the two and the four hat, uh, snares, and then my hats. Very basic, but that controls the drums. Um, and then in my Ableton project, each of those um, gets rooted to each particular drum track from the Oxy one. So kick, snare, hat, open, clap, ride, shaker, bongo. And then I've got these three utility 
MIDI tracks again so that I can combine my bass track with my Neutron and my K2. And then my virtual pedal board, which works exactly the same way as in the Ambient project. And that's the utility for my drum track. We have um, one individual track for each different hit. Um, and the reason why I do this rather than having a single track with um, traditionally kick, snare, hat on each of the pad is so that I can have multiple variations for the same kind of hit. So on this kick track, I have three different kicks that I can use. So hopefully you can hear this. Nope, you can't hear it. Um... Ah, you can't hear it because I need to load up a different Reaper project. Okay, yep, so we have that kick, that kick, and then this one isn't actually enabled, but this kick. So three different kicks that I can use, um, and the way this works um, is that each drum hit has a specific uh, MIDI note that it receives. So for the kick, it receives a C. For the snare, it receives a C sharp. For the hat, it receives a D. For the hat open, it receives a D sharp, etc., etc. Um, but each of these different variations are set f um, by a different octave. So this kick receives uh, a C1. This kick receives a C2. This kick receives a C3, etc., etc. Um, and I can the reason why I do that is because the Oxy One allows you to change the bass note in the um, in the multi-track sequencer to whatever you want. So if I want to change all of these notes to C2 for the second um, sample, I can do. Or if I just want to change one, I can do. Uh, I have a basic EQ for each of the drum pads. On the kick, I have a compressor. Shouldn't have that. Compressor and um, a drum bus just to give it some oomph. And then I have uh, my track filter, uh, my audio sends track, and then this magical Max for Life plugin. Um, so with my radio project, um, I run effects on each track rather than using actual sends because when I record the stems I want the audio to be sort of recorded as is rather than having a uh, a big old sort of sends track with all the different effects and plus I like to tweak the effects per track. Hello Kate, thank you so much and welcome in. I need a little breather because I've been talking almost for an hour now. Let me have a little drink. Uh, yeah, so although I've got these two uh, return tracks up here, these sense tracks, they don't actually have anything running on them. Um, they're just placeholders. And what I do is I use this Max for Life plugin here to map the knobs on each track, the sense knobs, to something else on the track. So here I have it set to the gain for the reverb and the gain for the uh, delay sense here. So although it will send the audio to this return track, it doesn't actually do anything, but it does control the volume here for something else. And that's a really neat little trick um, to make use of the return knobs via the push that you can't see um, to control the sends without it actually sending to a sends track. And then I do that for all of my drums. So again, kick, snare, hat, open, clap, ride, shaker, bongo, and they're all color coded. I don't remember to breathe. Um, yeah, and that's my drum track. I don't have any clips loaded, although I do have a template on my launch pad to be able to trigger them. I don't really ever use them, but it's there if I do need to. This track is my uh, I don't know why I called it trans, but this is basically just a filter sweep track. So I have a white noise that you can't hear. It's lovely white noise. Um, but then each of these clips has a different modulation set for the filter sweep. 
so that it sounds very nice like a wave washing over you that I can f uh, fade in and out. Very useful, particularly for transitions. Ah, that's why I called it trans, because it's for transitions. I remember now. And then finally, the last drum track I, I have is a sequencer plugin called XO. And this is an amazing plugin. You can't see it because it's a floating window. Um, but I highly recommend checking it out. Um, really cool, really cool sequencer. But I use that as sort of my secondary drum kit. And then I have my drum bus. So that just takes all of the drum signals and runs it through a glue compressor. And then I have my specific drum reverb and specific drum delay that I can send from each of these drum tracks. And that's the drum group. Now on to the MIDI group. Now this is where it gets complicated. This, this is where it gets complicated. So I'm going to have to try and think how I'm going to explain this. All right. So essentially, the basic principle is that I have um, these five, is it five or six? These six MIDI tracks. So this is where I record all of my MIDI and um, load up different instruments and all that jazz. Um, the way I have it set up, each of these MIDI tracks will send the audio to one of these looper tracks. And these looper tracks receive audio from the MIDI tracks um, and then output to uh, to Reaper, which is, then gets recorded, but then also out to the stream, which is what you hear. They go through um, my track filters here, which is controlled by my Fader Fox. Um, and then I've got a couple of extra things on it, like a volume um, and a beat repeat. So this beat repeat will allow me to just like repeat the beat. It's useful sometimes. I don't really use it, but it's useful. Um, and the reason why I have it set up like this is because if I want to use a track, but it's currently playing something, rather than stopping the MIDI and stopping the audio to then spend 15, 20 minutes finding a new instrument and recording a new MIDI track, what I can do is I can record that audio into a clip. And then that clip will be playing whilst I do all of that stuff. So it, it sounds nice and I can then fade it out and fade in the new MIDI or just change over to the new MIDI track um, a lot quicker and a lot more sort of melodically, I guess. Um, very useful. Um, I don't really use it that much to record audio clips, but it's there if I need to. So it's very handy. And then I've got my two guitar tracks. So same principle as in my ambient project. I've got two different tracks for my guitar that receive audio from my virtual pedal board. Okay, that's the audio routing. Now for the actual MIDI tracks. Um, so all of my MIDI tracks are structured in the exact same way um, because they're all mapped onto my uh, launch pads in the exact, exact same way. So we have um, some MIDI utilities, so things like locking the note so it will only play the same note. Um, hold note, so when you play a note it will sustain. Uh, this allows me to add an octave or shift up an octave or shift down an octave or add an octave down. Arp Crafter is a really cool little sort of arpeggiator Max for Live plugin. Um, if you go to my blog on Medium, medium.com forward slash Scruffy Fox, I think, I wrote a blog post about um, how I modified this patch to work with my push. So that's useful. But this basically allows me to hold different notes and then based on the position of the playhead and the position of the note it will either play the note or play the second note or the third note etc etc so you can get some really nice little patterns with this and i added a little randomize button so i can randomize the pattern which is useful then we have a normal arpeggiator we have a gate sequencer so this is a device that i built or i sort of hacked from another device but i built this um, and this is uh, it's a gate sequencer so each step progresses along with the playhead um, but if a bubble is off then it doesn't play any MIDI notes so it's useful if I want to record a very long melodic clip but only really want to play like half of it I can sort of do that or put a two bar or a one bar or whatever 
So that's really useful. Hey, Retzel, how are you doing? Thank you so much for the happy affiliate. And on that note, I'm going to have a drink because I've been talking for a long time. Okay. We have a velocity. We have a pass. So that's what's mapped to my launch pad. So when I click that, no MIDI will go through. But all of my effects after the instrument chain will continue until they fade out. So it sounds a lot better rather than just hard cutting or hard muting the, the track. And we have a MIDI monitor that just tells me what notes going through. And then we have our complete control plugin. So the bass, yellow, blue and pink tracks all run complete control. My external track is all my hardware synths. And then my green track runs a couple of Ableton plugins that I've got set. We then have a filter. We have a delay, which is replica again, my go to delay, really nice. We have a reverb, ROM again, my go to, really nice reverb. Uh, we have a sidechain. So this sidechain um, basically takes. No, it doesn't take. Uh, no, so this side chain is actually quantized. So every beat that happens, it will dip the the audio in the in the EQ down, so it gives it a sort of pump pump sound, which is really nice. Uh, we have a pan, another EQ, and then we have our actual side chain compressor, which is uh, side chains to the kick. So that will dip the low frequencies uh, for the kick to allow the kick to be more prominent and present um useful useful to have and then again my audio center so when i move the a and b tracks that actually moves the wet knobs here for the reverb and the delay so rather than sending it to a sense track it sends it to these two plugins here and that's duplicated along all of these midi tracks well included in this one as well all of these MIDI tracks and that's that's it that's my project it's incredibly complicated but this is the project um, so you can see here I've got all of these clips loaded so normally for an improv I don't start with anything maybe a drum pattern or a bass line or something like that but everything is created from scratch but for this project I have selected from my pool of favorite improvs in the last year, all of these different MIDI clips. So each of the color represents a different uh, key. So we've got A major, A flat major, B major, C major, D major, D flat major, F sharp major, G major. And we're gonna, we're gonna jam with these and see how it goes. And I have no idea how it's gonna go because I haven't really tested it. So we're gonna see how it goes. But first, we're gonna uh, we're gonna set up. So, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. More information or other information? Exclamation mark set up. I try and keep my blog up to date, but because I change it so much, it's difficult. Uh, but every like three or four four months or so, I, I I update it a bit with what's changed. Hey, syncopated, how you doing? Thank you so much and welcome in. You just missed my entire walkthrough, but it's okay because I'm going to cut these bits out and I'm going to upload it to my YouTube. Steezy Mac, how you doing? Welcome in. Uh, so yeah, that's it. 